2003, I completed a web development certificate at uh, George Washington University. So from 2003 until now, I've been developing websites. And that's some of the stuff I kind of enjoy doing because I enjoy being creative. Um, along with designing websites, one of the things I used to be into, I'm still kind of into hip hop. So I actually developed a hip hop website. So I think roughly around 2003, 2004, 2005 time frame. Before social media was you know, big, I mean, we did have stuff like Black Planet and some of those pages for those people who know about Black Planet. Um, I think at one point in the prime of this website I, I developed, I think I was averaging around 10,000 hits per month. So in terms of web traffic and all that stuff like that, that's some of the things that interest me. Now, for this particular discussion tonight, this is not going to be a, a how-to of social media. You know, we'll touch on some of the different aspects of social media, but if, if we, if we want to have a follow-on discussion for tutorials and things along those lines, uh, we could do that as, as well probably later on. Okay, so... From my opinion, the start of social media started with the printing press. Um, this is some of the stuff we go over at, at seminary, and it's the, the Gutenberg printing press was actually developed um, in the 1400s, and Johannes Gutenberg was actually the first person to print the Bible on um, what was metal, metal print, removable print type. Um, prior to that, metal type engravings were made on wood woodcuts. And this Bible was actually published in 1455. Now, one of the things I find important about this actual invention is because the Bible was actually able to be mass produced at this particular time, this, this meant that many people who didn't have access to the to Bible because it was either being written or it was <clears throat> a little bit more expensive because it was rare, they would actually have access to the gospel and that would spark scholasticism and um, a different mindset because that everybody actually would be able to have their own you know, personal Bible. Now what is social media? Ba basically in a nutshell, social media is a conversation supported by the use of online tools. So here we see a laptop, many of us have mobile devices, a lot of us use mobile devices in church. I see you because I'm in the balcony so I can see down to what you're doing. So, despite trying to hide your mobile device in your purse or anything like that in text or Facebook, you're still being observed. <laughs> but I, I'll, show, I'll, show, I'll show towards the end why that's okay. Now, some of the tools that we use for social media are YouTube. For those that don't know what YouTube, you, YouTube is, it's actually a video service. Um, I'll get into some of the statistics with YouTube in a couple of slides further. Um, we have the F, the F is Facebook. The first T in the middle is Twitter. Um, for those that don't know what Facebook is, it's pretty much a, a website to where you quote unquote link up with your friends. You can share links to articles. You can share um, pictures. You can share text. A lot of people here tend to put their life story. F Facebook actually developed something recently, uh, which is called a timeline, to where um, any information you post is, is based on a, a actual timeline. So somebody could actually scroll down and see what you posted in February 2011. Um, so it actually points to different aspects of your life, um, if you allow it to. Um, Twitter, for those who don't know what Twitter is, it's pretty much just a, a text feed to where you can post uh, links and text. Um, one thing about Twitter, it's limited to 140 characters, so you have to limit you know, what you say on Twitter uh, per tweet. Uh, the IN is LinkedIn, and that's a professional service, so a lot of people you know, go to LinkedIn and they actually post their resumes. What I'm seeing now is that a lot of recruiters are on LinkedIn. And this, is, this actually gives you a networking website that's based around you know, your professional career. Um, so at the top right, the camera, that's Instagram. I'm still pretty new to Instagram because for me, I have an Android device, which is, which is made by Google. 
And Instagram is strictly sharing photos, and it's only on, on your phone. Um, but I find interesting about Instagram is although people can only share photos, oftentimes I see pictures of words. So it's even, even with Insta Instagram, people are still talking with words. Um, and the final T is Tumblr. Tumblr is like a blogging website, and I think it kind of combines some of the aspects of some of the things we, we spoke about, and it just makes blogging a little bit more accessible to those who aren't too familiar with blogging. Also, I ask that if you have any questions, you can hold them to the end, and then we'll you know, have a, a group discussion. Now, if you can't see this, for those who are in the back, this is a statistics from 2010-2011. Here, uh, we see uh, internet users, U.S. internet users who use social networking sites. Um, for those 18 to 29 years of age, 86% of that population is using social media in some way. Uh, for those 30 to 49, 61% are using social media, 50 to 64, 47%, and 65 years plus 26%. And it, as you can see based on the, on the, the slope, um, as time you know goes on, it, it seems to pick the usage actually picked up. Now here is statistics for daily users. Again, this is 2010 to 2011 statistics. Um, the top one, which is Facebook, that has 310 million unique visitors daily. 310, and that's just in the United States, I believe. Um, some of the other ones we talked about as well, but as you can see, um, for Facebook in particular, um, there's a lot of people, especially Americans, on Facebook. Um, and YouTube, which is the video website that we actually spoke about, or that I actually spoke, spoke about a reference, uh, one in four Americans watches a YouTube video every day. So how many people actually watch YouTube videos? Daily? Almost daily? Close to daily? Well, we got sermons online, so y'all should be watching, y'all should be referencing those YouTube videos at least once a week. Um, some more statistics. This is Twitter growth. Um, registered users in Twitter were 95 million. Um, tweets per day in the United States in 2011, 95 million. So this is some of the online statistics now. There are 2.1 billion internet users. Um, now, when I first did my research, it said Facebook had 500 million users, and then I did some more research you know, a couple of days ago, and Facebook actually just topped 900 million accounts. Um, as of February, Twitter has 571 registered users, and that's probably more than likely just going up daily. Now, um, what are African Americans doing? There are 23.9 million active African American users on the internet, and 76% of those users are using or vi visiting a social media or networking or blog site. And um, this actually comes from the 2011 2011 Nielsen report, uh, which is entitled The State of the African American Consumer. Uh, for those who actually want access to that, I could, I could email, you, email you that. Um, this is an important document, even past um, what it's talking about in terms of, of, of internet users, because what it actually pinpoints is our spending and our buying power. So one of the things that is also in this document, it actually shows that African Americans spend roughly, I think it was close to like a trillion dollars. So we combined our resources and, and pu pulled our resources together. Um, we would be either the 10th or 12th largest country in the world. Um, so the, the Nielsen studies actually pinpointing some of the things we do. So when they put together studies like this, um, they're able to see what we're doing, and then they're able to market to that stuff. So we, we kind of have to stay educated to how we as African Americans are spending our time, spending our money, and where we're 
going. Now, as a church, I find this is vital as well because if we understand that 76% of our community is online in some sort of form of way or, or in social media, I think that's where the church ha actually has to be itself. Now, here are just some tw Twitter followers. Now, I understand on the religious leader side that Oprah is not a religious leader, but she's spiritual and sometimes people you know, look to Oprah for spiritual advice. So on the left-hand side, religious leaders, we have Oprah with 11 million users. We have Joe Olstein, just about over close to 550,000 followers. Rev Run from Run, Run DMC, um, 3.2 million. Vash Todd McKenzie, 16,000. Um, TD Jakes, 320,000. And Sean King and, and Jay Gamble, who I'll reference later on, um, 36,000 and 37,000, respectively. Now, if we look at hip hop and pop culture, you'll see the influence and whose voice is, is extremely loud. So, Lady Gaga, mm -hmm. close to 24 million followers on Twitter. Now, what's amazing about this is when I first put together the slide presentation, um, I think she was at roughly like 19 million. So I re-ran the, the numbers last night, and I don't know how in a month you, she, she picked up like an additional 9 million followers. Um, Rihanna, R&B singer, she has 18 million. Kanye West, 7 million. Chris Brown, 9 million. Lil Wayne, 6 million. Now, what I find the most amazing is Beyonce. She has 4.1 million Twitter followers and has one tweet on her timeline. So she's not saying anything. And she has this huge following. Kevin Hart, the comedian, uh, close to 4 million followers as well. So again, we, I spoke about YouTube, which is, which is along the lines of social media in the video format. <clears throat> 60 hours of video are uploaded every minute. Or one hour of video is uploaded to YouTube every second. Over 4 billion videos are viewed every single day. Over 8 million unique visitors visit YouTube each month. Over 3 billion hours of video are watched each month on YouTube. Uh, more video was uploaded to YouTube in one month than the three U.S. networks created in 60 years. 70% of YouTube traffic comes from the U.S., which means, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, outside of the U.S., I'm sorry. Um, YouTube is localized in 39 countries and, and across 54 languages, and in 2011, YouTube had more than 1 trillion views or almost 140 views for every person on the earth. So now what? Now, if you can't see that in gray, it's saying the church has to make an adjustment. Now, oftentimes we think what we see outside is the front door of the church, but um, at least from my standpoint, and, and the, the leaders of the new members class can speak to this as well, when we receive new members or new members come to the church, the first thing that they're going to see is our internet and our online presence. So what becomes our, their first reference point of who we are is Google. So when they do Google searches or they're searching for churches, um, either things that we post on Facebook are going to come up or our website will actually come up. So we have to keep that in mind in terms of what we actually put out to put out online and, and to the world to actually see. Now, if we want to get biblical about this stuff, Jesus uh, spoke to the disciples when he first met them and, and he referenced uh, being fishers of men. And that's Matthew 4, 19 and, uh, excuse me, Matthew 4, 19 and 18. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was, who was called Peter, and, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Uh, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So the question I pose to us as a group and as a community, 
and as, as leaders as well, is how exactly do we fish for people today? Or do we? Um, where have our nets gone? Today, at least from what I see, is that oftentimes we don't, we as a church or churches in general don't really do as much outreach or they don't do the type of outreach that we see Jesus, Jesus doing in the Gospels. So although, that, although we see that Jesus often taught in synagogues, he actually met the people where they, they were at. So when he went to create disciples, he actually went, touched the disciples, and, and met them where they were at. In this case, with the first two disciples that we just spoke about, he actually met, met them where they were at, and that's where they, that's why, that's where they were fishing. So, we actually have to establish a plan. The plan for the church is to reach the people where they are. The gospel was a social gospel, meaning Jesus actually took the good news to the people. So, when we, like I said, when we see Jesus create disciples, he's in the community with disciples. When we look at all the references of Jesus healing, although there are references of Jesus actually healing in temples, a lot of times he um, was healing in, you know, in, 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 in the community. I think, um, I want to say in Mark, the first chapter, after Jesus has led, after he's tempted by the devil, he actually goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house, I believe, to where he, he, heals, he heals the mother-in-law, and then the whole community is outside the door, and he begins to heal those in the community. So a lot of, like I said, what I see that's different than what we do today is we come as a community to meet in a, in a building, but Jesus, to, to get the gospel as far spread as possibly could be, Jesus actually went to the people and then the gospel spread that way. So in terms of our online presence or the things that we, we actually do online, um, it's vital that we listen and read what the people are crying out for. Because what, what I've noticed, you'll be surprised to what people actually share online. A lot of people actually pour out their emotions. They pour, pour out their frustrations, um, whether it's about work, whether it's about life, whether it's about relationships. And people are, I'm not sure if they're using this. They may just be using these, these tools as a sounding board in a way. But people, some people are actually pretty transparent in terms of some of the things they're actually going through online. And I think we as church leaders have to pay attention to that because then we could be able to address the needs of the community. Um, we also have to share our content. Um, the next bullet is be personal, just don't post advertisements. So at least from the perspective of our particular website, we we're extremely good at posting advertisements. Um, we post the sermons, but um, there's only one aspect to where we where we engage the people, and that's what what, what Minister Lisa Dunson does, and I'll touch on that in a second. Um, but I think to move forward and to actually grow our community and, and grow the message that Covenant has for the people, we have to engage the people and just don't throw information at them because we, we, we announce what we do, but we don't, we don't necessarily make connections the way we actually could. Also, we could con contribute some additional meaningful infor information. So we could post daily devotions, uh, we could post links to articles, uh, we could post links to readings, or if we want to engage the people where they're, where they're at, we could just act, simply ask them questions. Up on me. Okay, so here's a video clip I like to play. Let me see if y'all can hear it. Put the mic to it. Uh, two million followers is, is quite an enormous responsibility. It's um, technology, like anything else that mankind creates, is a tool. And that tool can be used uh, for good or for evil, like a lightsaber. Um, and uh, technology is supposed to bring people together, streamline things, and make life easier. And in a lot of ways, it does that. Um, however, technology can also 
disconnect you from other people and break down the, the, the social network, the real social network of, of family and friends and interpersonal communication and isolate people, um, make them feel alone, make them feel small. Um, so it's a tool that needs to be used correctly. Um, I'm trying to think of an analogy, and I can't think of one. But I'll just say that, uh, you know, I use two million Twitter followers as a, as, as a tool. I, the reason I have Twitter is so people can get to know me as a different person other than Dwight. Uh, I just realized all of a sudden, like, oh, everyone thinks I'm Dwight. They think that I'm Dwight from the office and that I'm this kind of uh, annoying, uh, uh, difficult, nerdy, uh, creepy guy. I don't know Rain Wilson, although I'm a little bit nerdy, annoying, and creepy. Uh, I'm not as much as Dwight Schrute. And uh, it's a way for them to get to know my sense of humor and my passion projects, like Soul Pancake. And uh, so that's the purpose that it serves. But I don't want Twitter to be a time suck. I don't want it to take me away from my family and from what's important. Um, it's just a, a tool that I use. I now must show a second video clip. Now this second video clip is a video I actually shot at one of the early Trayvon Martin rallies. Um, I want to say there was, I can't, it was kind of hard for me to tell how many people were actually there, but I hear there were probably, they estimate between three, four, maybe 5,000 people out uh, during this, this rally for Trayvon Martin. And um, it was actually sparked by, you know, a few people on, on Twitter and Facebook. So I'll just play a minute of this because it's, it's fairly long. Now mind you, these people, most of these people had, had never met. And I was told by some three dynamic sisters, young sisters, three sisters who just wanted to do something in reference to Trayvon Martin Case and wanted to be able to come and make their voices heard. And these three sisters just put together a Facebook account, a Twitter page, and put out a call and all of you are here because of them. And we're so grateful for these three sisters. So three, three females, Facebook account, Twitter account, and roughly four to 5,000 people. Wow. So, and remember, he said this, this particular demonstration wasn't organized by a church, um, although there were church members there. So this, you know, when I heard that, it, it kind of, it, it dawned on me that the church needs to utilize these tools in order to um, affect the lives of people daily. Um, one, one of the things that I've noticed, you know, on my train rides when I used to ride um, Metro, is that everyone is plugged into their phones at some, some given time. Whether it's reading the Bible, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, and at least from my, ass, my, my, my standpoint, especially since I've been on these websites a ton of times, it becomes extremely noisy um, to the point where it actually becomes 
it, first, of course, it, it's, it's going to become addictive because every five to ten minutes, you're going to check to see what your friends are doing. You're going to check to see what your your uh, the people you're following are doing. Um, so instead of the church being apprehensive to this type of technology, I think the church needs to in insert themselves there um, in order to um, in order to just you know move and actually show that the spirit of God could actually be in different places and experienced in different ways. So what we're currently doing is so I'll show some of the stuff we do. So here, I have to close this out. Here's our covenant, one of our covenant pages. Here you'll see we have roughly, uh, we have 222 members. Um, this particular page that we have on Facebook is mainly just announcements. Um, here we'll see, you see we posted pictures from the fashion show. Um, now we have another group page which is managed by um, Minister Lisa Dunson, um, Alima, and Richard Arroyo. And Lisa actually does a, a great job um, of reaching out and doing like close to daily devotions. I, how long have you been doing this? Uh, three years. For three years, she has been doing devotionals, and you can't see in the top right hand corner there's 676 members at this this present time. So. Um, Lisa, although she represents Covenant, she, I would, I would, I would push the button and say she almost has her own, on, excuse me, almost has her own online congregation because most of the interaction um, here that we'll see, we'll just see, you know, posts from her in terms of um, reflections and in terms of encouragement. So you'll see, you'll just scroll down, conversations with, you know, people. Um, Rich is posting some bulletins, and you'll just see that, you know, she's extremely dedicated to what, you know, she's doing here. But if we, if we as a community of leaders push this further, you know, we could further extend, you know, what, what Lisa's actually doing online. So... Let's see, I think people might have said hello. Let's see. Okay. So I actually, before I started the presentation, just to show you how people talk or talk back, I actually asked a couple of people to say hello. So one of my friends, Robert Mitchell, says, great, Sorrell. I'm sure your participants will get a lot out of it. Uh, Jalissa, member, says make sure to teach Pastor Dennis about Twitter so we can keep him up, keep him up with uh, keep up with him during sabbatical. No. No? You guys no. said no? <laughs> Did somebody say no? We don't want to know what Pastor Dennis is doing. Okay. Um, so that's some of the things that's going on with, with, with us. I also want to touch on um, and we're, we're almost finished with some of the stuff that's going on on Twitter. So, Twitter, I actually decided to really go in and see how far I could push this thing. So, in, in maybe like a week, a week and a half, I got close to 450 followers. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm just amazed at how many people actually want to be followed on Twitter just because either they're promoting music stuff or they just want to be followed. So I'm not even sure what, what's the, the mindset now. I don't, the majority of these people I don't know, so if you, if you read or come across something that's crazy, it's not me, I don't know any of these people, um, but you'll see, you'll see some crazy stuff. So if anybody's on my Twitter feed, I hope you didn't post anything crazy, because you know, I, don't, I don't want to get y'all in trouble or anything like that. Um, so you'll just see a ton of stuff. Just a ton of people on Twitter, um, but you know it, it does spark a conversation because I you know I'll post some things on here and it, you know a lot of times you you'll get in dialogue with people you don't know or never talk never talk to or never seen and these people could be anywhere in, in, on, on the planet. Uh, let's see if I have any messages very quick. You have a question. 
Say again? Can you go back one was finished? Um, somebody <laughs> says, God bless you, thank you for following me back. Um, Reverend Hilda Hudson, who I know, says, God bless you and your class on social media. Um, when used effectively, it can be a powerful tool. So now, who, I'm gonna show you two um, ministers who actually use this, this Twitter, team, Twitter tool to their advantage. One is Sean King, who I came across. He's a former pastor of a church in Atlanta. As you see, he has 36,000 followers, but um, he actually started a website called uh, hopemob.org, which is this website right here. Now, he, he's, he's pushed generous giving to, to the max. Like, I'm, like, what he's actually done online, I, I find it like extremely amazing. One of the first things I've seen him do is that he actually um, got, I think, over $100,000 from complete strangers to take, hint, to take tents to Haiti. Um, based on that success, he actually developed his own website. So what, he, what you'll see here is people will, will submit their stories of, you know, things they're in need or, you know, just people are actually just reaching out for help financially. And you'll see that people actually pour in donations. So for this particular story, um, they actually surpassed their goal. But what, what, what drives me it, it, crazy about this type of stuff, it happened so quick because I looked at this earlier and they were like $1,500 short. So you'll see that people actually donate and they are willing to help online and this is people they've never had any contact with, people who they don't even know about. Um, Pastor Jay Gamble, who was the, the second per person I spoke of, he actually has something which he does called Twitter Church. So I think at between 9 and 11 Eastern time every evening, he tweets a sermon. And um, it'll it, it, it probably could go on for a couple of minutes. I mean, it's not like, you know, one of our sermons to where it's like a, a manuscript or anything. But, like, there's, there's such a buzz with his sermons because you'll see retweets, you'll see um, people saying stuff back to him. So he's engaging, you know, a different community in a, di a different way that, you know, sometimes uh, in our traditional ways we, we don't look to do. So, um, inclusive church. Inclusivity must become a trending topic. Now, what a trending topic is, is on Twitter, basically, it is a topic that everybody is, is kind of chiming, chiming in on. So whenever you see a pound sign, it, it's, it's usually associated with Twitter, and it's a, sociable, it's a searchable item. So for us, since the message is that of an inclusive church, um, we need to push this message because the message needs to be more than local. So here at Covenant and, you know, um, outside of the doors of our church, you know, people know about inclusivity. But in order for us to push the message out and in order for it to spread, we have to utilize some of these online tools in the way that, you know, other people are doing. Um, and one scripture that stands out to me in particular is Matthew 9, um, 30, I'm see, Matthew 9, verses 30 and 31. And it references Jesus healing, you know, a blind man, a blind, blind man. And it says, their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly charged them, see that no one knows it. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all of the district. I think other translations say throughout the land. So at Covenant, being that we're in a, a healing environment, and it's a little bit different than what we normally see at the black church, it's time to take that message and spread it all in all directions. Um, because, at least for me, it's a vital message, but we have to view ourselves as the champions of that message in order to get it out, and in order to at least get people having a conversation about the idea of inclusivity. And that's the end of my presentation. So now I'll open it for discussions if anybody has any questions. I, I believe you referenced the Matthew 9 verse 
I'm, I was clueless about how someone that you don't know will connect with you on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So you go to a message uh, section, uh, well, on Twitter. a trending topic section. Yeah, on Twitter, they'll actually, there's a few things they'll do. They'll recommend on the left-hand side people that you could follow that are similar to people that you're following. Okay. Um, you could also do searches based on your email address, and then you could just start following people. Like it, Twitter, with, with the privacy, is a little bit different. You, you can block your feeds, but what I, what I see is most people don't block their feeds. So you can follow somebody and you'll just get all their updates coming in consistently. I hadn't touched Pinterest yet. Like okay. these things, they're, they're just raining. Like the, the Twitter thing, I wasn't gonna do Twitter. Right. Um, until you know, I, I kind of saw a couple of people on it, and then I just kind of connected to it. So for me, it's like one at a time because my brain can only take <laughs> so much. Because Pinterest is that kind of um, social network where you you do like based on mm -hmm. what you have in common. Yeah. Or whatever. And, uh, Pinterest. P I N T. Oh, Pinterest. Yeah. And the third question um, is: Is it possible for Pastor to tweet us as he experiences his battle? That's up to Pastor, but I think that 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 like I, I don't know who spoke out but I guess that that problem might be a little bit too much. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't have to, I mean, he could be like Beyonce. Two <laughs> tweets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll send one tweet. One tweet, right? We'll just stick there to your followers. <laughs> so, okay, hey, hey, where are we coming? Um, so you touched just a little on this, and wanted you to, I wanted you to go a little deeper. You mentioned our website, mm -hmm. and that you felt as if it would be more engaging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, outside of just announcements. Uh -huh. And so I wanted you to um, expound a little bit on what you meant by that and maybe, I mean, how do you think, what are some ways in which we can engage um, persons a, a little bit better or more? Okay. Yeah. Um, starting from the top, and I, I ran through this idea in my head like a, a few times. Think Pastor Dennis and Pastor Chris, we could shoot a video of them and have them introduce themselves to our online audience. Um, that could we could do probably do that the same for for the ministers as well. Um, I I'm hesitant, like we're hesitant about leaving these things open for comments um, on our website in particular because you get the the hate stuff. Yeah. And, and all that stuff. So this is why, you know, when we have sermons and stuff like that, we don't leave it open for comments just because we don't want that stuff on the website. Because um, then, e even though you get into theological discussions, they start to become arguments. And some people just post nasty things. Um, one of the things we could also do, um, we could be intentional about using our social media that's actually on the website. So, say for instance, this last sermon that's posted, I could actually tweet it to my, tw my followers, and actually I'll just do that right now. Or, you know, I could just type something in, and that could actually start a discussion, because even when we share stuff on Facebook, In sharing it, I can type a message, and then that can further spark a discussion, you know, through Facebook. So when you say you can tweet the sermon, you can hear the whole sermon? I just tweeted a link. So what, what'll, what happens is, in their news feed, the link will come up, and then it'll take them to our website. Any other questions? Yeah, what about uh, blocking or security around Facebook and Twitter? What is that process? Um, Once you're on there, you're on there for everybody to see or not. All right. So th there's there's different ways security like security is 
Well, with Twitter anyway, you can just block your block your feeds and approve anybody who actually you want to see your feeds. Uh, with Facebook, it's a little bit more complex. But for me, the, the best security is just not to post a whole bunch of personal stuff. Um, some, like I said, some people tend to share a, a ton of stuff. With Facebook, let's see. Facebook generally changes their security settings a lot. Um, so there's privacy settings here. And here, um, on the left-hand side, you can make it public to where everything you post goes out to everybody in the world. Um, you can just post stuff to your friends, or you can customize it. So I have, I have mine set up for custom, because if I don't really mess with you like that, I'll put you in this little box. So you probably can only see like two photos and a couple of links. Any other questions? All right, so for those of us who stay here, we're going to do a quick exercise, and then we'll be done. You know, to wrap it up, just oh, go ahead. a quick, a quick yes, comment. Yes. One of the, the challenges that, that I have had, and I, I don't know if I still have it or not, but I get a lot of comments. And I, I think that the questions and the, um, um, the curiosity people have around our ministry here, uh, yes, I've, I mean, I've gotten a lot of I got, I've gotten a lot of nasty. Yeah, I've know. seen some of them. Um, and, but staying engaged with some of these folks has actually helped, as President Obama said, evolve them. Mm -hmm. you know, so one of the things that I am really interested in when it comes to especially the Friends page is I, I'd actually like another voice on the page, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Sometimes I don't feel I'm equipped to answer some of the questions. And I've just, I know I've sent some things to Minister Camper to, to send to you know, mm -hmm. the pastors. But I do think that because people can talk back to us and ask us questions about our ministry and about why we have an inclusive theology here, uh, even though the conversation is not always a comfortable one, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a good place to, to kind of have that conversation. Um, and then the second part is that I'd also like to figure out how we can bring those 600 and some odd people into the, yeah. you know, that, into the, that's a, the that's a challenge. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe, maybe, we, maybe we, could, we could try to do something like that, like Kim said, maybe a Facebook party or something like that, or just reach out and maybe have a special service. It, it, like it's, I think it's hit or miss with those things, but um, if people are willing to give their money to strangers, I think at, if we reach out or we make a strategic plan, the people, at least in this area, will actually come out. Yeah. Was there anything else? Any other questions? A Facebook fellowship. Yeah. That would actually be a good idea. So, so, how many people have smartphones or phones in general? You didn't bring your phone? Yeah, you, you have your phone with you or internet with you. So we're gonna we gonna post for, for all those who have a social media account. Yeah, I mean, do you have social media? It, it, I mean, even if you just want a text message or send an email. Huh? Yeah. She don't be on. We'll, we'll, we'll have to work with Pastor for some time. Pastor did this on Facebook. But, so for those who, who don't have internet access or don't have Facebook accounts, you can bring up your email or just bring up a couple of people you want to text because we're going to reach out to a virtual church or a virtual community. So if you want to bring up your phone and text message somebody, if you want to Facebook this message, if you want to tweet this message, we'll just do something simple. So for me, I'm going to post this on my Facebook and Twitter pages. The message is simple. Just God loves you and so do I.
uh, posting a text message or posting something to see a social media website through your phone um, that says God loves you and so do I. So we're, we're actually <laughs> ministering to a virtual congregation right now. Yeah, or texting. So if you have Facebook or Twitter on your phone, you can send it, you can send it out that way. If you don't, you can uh, email it or you can text message it. Yeah, it's that simple. Like for me, I think I have five hundred. A little bit over 500 Twitter followers, um, maybe another 700 Facebook friends, five. I probably just, I potentially just sent the message to 1,400 people in 30 seconds. So that's, that's what I want, going out, that's what I want us to realize how powerful technology is. Because if we actually pull our resources together and, and maybe one day do this as a church, we probably have the potential to reach tens and twenty and, and, and thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, hundred thousand people. Um, and with that said, we also have to keep in mind that at least with our website, we, we're getting business visitors from everywhere. So I've seen some of the statistics. We get visitors from Nigeria, um, Germany. India, Canada. So this is what we want to keep in mind in terms of our future ministries and how we actually do outreach. So this was just kind of just to scratch the surface in terms of getting a, getting the ball rolling in, in terms of how we actually push the technology, um, the use of technology in our actual ministry. Thank you.